coming up on this edition of Press Watch 2012. The YouTube video that ignited protests around the world. How do journalists decide what of that video they use on the air? And Mitt Romney's now infamous words about the 47%. We'll explore the media machine, the entire industry whose job it is to troll for gaps. And later, Press Watch's Bravos and Blunders. Who gets this week's props for a job well done or not so much? Welcome to Press Watch 2012. I'm Wendy Brunner. Press Watch is a production of the Mass Communications Department at Oklahoma City University, made possible by the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. We're looking at national news media coverage of the presidential campaign, the news in light of ethical guidelines within the professional journalism community. To do that, we are joined today by Alex Cameron from News 9 KWTV, the CBS affiliate here in town, the director of Griffin Communications Oklahoma Impact Team. That means you are a seasoned investigative reporter. We thank you for your time. My pleasure to be here. All right. And for the first time on Press Watch, we have invited a student to join us. <laughs> Rachel Morse is a senior here at OCU and a promising young journalist in her own right. So thank you both, actually, for talking with us today. We thought it would be really valuable to have a young journalist and a seasoned veteran <laughs> together to talk to us about some of these ethical things. Thanks for not saying old. Old journalist. Uh, no, no, I wouldn't go yeah, there. I'm an old right. journalist too. Okay. Let's begin first by going backward a couple of weeks. Uh, let's go back to September 11th, this September 11th, where we first heard about the protests or attacks, if you'd rather, um, on the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, on the consulate in Benghazi. On the 11th, we first started hearing that these protests were related to this YouTube trailer um, about uh, called the innocence of Muslims. Um, famous now, I think we've all heard about it. We first started really hearing about this from the press on the 11th, kind of late in the 11th and into September 12th. And I want to begin this conversation by showing you a story that came from ABC News, from Nightline, just a tiny little snippet from September 12th. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Why? What's inflamed the mad passions of mobs and protesters in the streets? A movie. An incredibly amateurish, crude, and nasty movie made in the United States and released on YouTube. Innocence of Muslims, it's called. And it depicts the Prophet Muhammad as a dope, a fraud, a pedophile, and a womanizer. All right, I'm singling out Nightline specifically because all of the broadcast networks that night were doing this story, obviously. Nightline, however, on this day, was the only network who chose to use those images from the Innocence of Muslims from that YouTube video. Um, NBC, CBS did not. So, Alex, I'd like to begin by asking you first, when you think about telling stories that involve inflammatory images, pictures, or video, what is the decision-making process that goes into that choice? Do we use these images in our storytelling as journalists or not? Well, obviously, there has to be a good deal of thought that goes into this. And, um, and it's obviously going to be more than just one person who's, um, who's considering this. Uh, with, with something of this magnitude, obviously, you're going to convene um, probably all the way up to the, the top person um, in your newsroom to decide, do we, do we really need to use these images? And, you know, at that time, as this story was de still developing, there may not have been quite the awareness that we have now of just how much this was going to inflame the Islamic world. Um, and so, you know, in, I don't have a particular problem with the images that they, they used at this stage in the development of the story. Um, but obviously they must have put a great deal of, of thought into it, I would, I would imagine, uh, because they obviously they chose, rather than running any actual clips or, well, they did, I guess they used a little bit of sound from the, uh, 
from the video. They actually did not. It was a still image, and they didn't use any of the underlying sound. There was no nat sound there, as we call it. Um, yeah, it was just a still image that they, you know, made look like it was moving. But it was not a video clip. It was a still pic. And I was going to ask you about that specifically. If you thought that, there is a difference between using a still image from that video as opposed to using some of the actual video. What well, do you think? Yeah, I, you know, I, I suppose... Um, I suppose it's a way of trying to give uh, your audience maybe a flavor of what's in the video, but without, you know, going all the way and, and, and um, you know, and that you might be able to defend yourself more by saying, well, we only used a couple of still images. Um, and so I think that that is probably, uh, it, it, you could probably consider that less offensive. Uh, again, I didn't have a particular problem with what they used there. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't. I, what, I'm, what I'd be interested now, knowing now, is would they have done the same thing, knowing what they know now about what this was going to, what was going to happen, what was going to ensue with this video? Would they still have made the same decision? I'm glad that you said that because <laughs> I, uh, we're going to make a point about this in just a moment. I don't want to pick on ABC. We're going to go back to that thought in yeah. just a second, Alex. Actually, but I wanted to ask you, Rachel. We talk a lot um, since you're a student. We talk a lot in classes about ethical guidelines that we have within the journalism community. One in particular um, just jumps to mind, in my mind, from the Society of Professional Journalists um, about the spirit of minimizing harm in our storytelling and recognizing that gathering and reporting information may cause harm and discomfort. And so in my mind, I think we always have to weigh the value of our storytelling against the damage that we might do. And so as a student, I'd like your thoughts on whether using images from that kind of video adds anything to the story or not. Because in the United States, it's still available on YouTube. If you want to see it, you can go and get it for yourself. So do we add any value to our storytelling by showing those images? Yeah, this sounds like a paper title from one of my legal and ethical principles class. But um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that the value that comes from this is that viewers are, there's strong language that the reporter is giving, you know, amateur, crude, and that's really important, but it's the images and the language that tie together that really bring that across. When it comes to minimizing harm, I think that the video itself is very harmful. And Starting out as a journalist, I always thought, oh, we really need to pr protect the people. We need to protect our viewers. That's our job. But it's also our job to inform them. And I think minimizing harm would be to inform them, to let them know what's, what's going on, and giving them a point of reference, a still picture, something that's not a lengthy clip of a very offensive video, is, is minimizing harm in that sense. But I think the harm would be not making people aware of this situation. Absolutely. I think that would be the harm. So visual representation goes hand in hand with the information. Mm -hmm. I want to use that to go back to what you mentioned about, um, and kind of tie this in, I'm, again, I'm not picking on ABC. On the evening of the 12th, as I said, ABC was the only broadcast network who used any of those images. On September 13th, the following night, um, none of the broadcast networks used any of those images. And I want to show you an excerpt quickly um, from NBC News, and we'll talk about it for just a moment. Let's go ahead and take a look at that from NBC. Now about this movie, this anti-Islam film that has sparked so much outrage in the Middle East, as we've seen after showing up on the Internet. It's now been taken down from YouTube in Egypt and some other places. And NBC News has decided not to show any of it on the air. Okay, in preparation for this show, our students dug through news coverage from the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th. ABC, again, the only one to show any of this video on the 12th. On the 13th, NBC, Brian Williams obviously said, you know what, we decided we're not going to show it. That night, also on the 13th, nobody else did either. Afterwards, after the 13th, I think it was around the 14th or 15th, um, as my students were combing through the internet, looking back at some of these shows, we discovered that ABC's newscast, Nightline, from the 12th, where they had shown those images, was no longer posted online. I'm not going to speculate about why that may or may not be. It may have been a technical fluke. But it makes me wonder about having your competitor 
at another station, another network, make a decision and come right out and say, we're not going to show these images. So then where does that leave us with the decision, okay, are we going to change our minds now and do what everybody else is doing, which is not show pictures or not? I don't want to speculate about what ABC may or may not have done, only ask you, Alex, for your opinion on how influenced are we by what the competition is doing? Well, I, I think a lot, and um, you know, I, I don't know whether in this particular case um, NBC's decision would have played a role. Um, I, more, more than likely, I would guess that they realized, you know, we're playing with fire here, and uh, maybe the, the the need to inform doesn't outweigh the risk, the potential risk, and they thought we gave our audience a taste of this last night. That's enough. And that brings up another issue about how journalism has changed because now things live on in perpetuity right. on the internet. And so maybe they just felt, you know, w w we satisfied perhaps the curiosity that was out there. People certainly would have wanted to know, what is this? You know, most, most of us hadn't seen this video, had no idea what they were talking about. What is this they're talking about? They showed a couple of images. The next day they decide, this is going to get out of hand, or it's already getting out of hand. We need to take it down. I would doubt that, that NBC's decision played into their decision. Certainly, it does happen. It does happen. I'm just guessing that in this case, it didn't. And you mentioned weighing risk. So in your mind, we're thinking about risk in terms of not offending our viewers, risk in terms of inciting violence or fanning flames. Is that what you, well, is that what you meant? Well, maybe, both. Maybe offending viewers, but all the way to the end of the spectrum of incite, perhaps inciting violence. Yeah. So um, they may have considered all those things, but certainly there was, become, you know, there was evidence, I suppose, at that point that these images alone um, might incite people to violence. All right. Um, you mentioned changing journalism. That's a good place for us to stop. We're going to segue here and come back to this idea. Coming up on Press Watch, watching and waiting for a misstep. Cameras are everywhere and video never goes away. How research organizations document it all, pass it along to the press and influence the political system. Next. Welcome back to Press Watch 2012, where we're looking at the national news media and ethics, how it all works during this presidential election. Still with us are Alex Cameron from News 9 and Rachel Morris, our broadcast journalism student from here at OCU. Thank you again both for sticking around. All right, moving on to something that you mentioned a few minutes ago, Alex, about the changing nature of journalism. I'm going to go there with technology um, and point out we have a, a still picture of surreptitious video of Mitt Romney that I think everyone has seen now. The remarks about the 47% of Americans. Um, I think we've all seen this, so we don't actually need to see it again. But this video, granted, this was video that was leaked to a media organization, Mother Jones. Um, however, I think that it's representative of this trend that we've seen over the last number of years where we are looking for, waiting for, anticipating mistakes. We want that. And it feels to me like um, viewers, news consumers are craving that. And there was a wonderful piece recently um, from NBC's news magazine, Rock Center, on this very issue about gaff trolling. So let's go ahead and take a look at that really quickly. Constantly monitoring every broadcast, every major publication and website, documenting bias as it occurs. We provide all this to the Mark Levins, to the Sean Hannity's, to the Rush Limbaugh's. They, in turn, have got millions of listeners. Describe what they do. So what a Media Matters will do or what Brent Bozell's outfit does is they're going to have instantly at their fingertips four or five years of Mitt Romney video clips and quotes and tapes of what he has said in the past. And the same you, thing you, is going you, on on the other you side. You count right? on, those, on those organizations essentially to be research arms for our, for our partisanship. So they're feeding the sausage machine. Absolutely. And as they mentioned, entire organizations who do nothing but monitor all the mainstream media, read major publications, looking for someone, somewhere, to say something, anything that could be inappropriate, 
ill-advised, inelegant maybe. So Alex, let me begin with you by asking you, how do you think that this um, craving mistakes, it seems like, has that changed uh, journalism, reporting, do you think? Well, I'd like to think that it hasn't changed real journalism, um, but I think realistically we all understand that it, that it is changing because we're all, it, there, there's no longer any clear line between, you know, what, what I call editorial, editorialism and, and true journalism. I mean, it's been blurred, it was blurred years ago. So when, you know, when the CNNs and um, even, and the networks are, are reporting on these events that you, you know, that we're talking about here, it's like the 47% comment. I mean, it, it obviously that sort of stuff is bleeding over into the mainstream media. Um, so it, it certainly has affected journalism. Um, and it's, but it's also sort of a, ref a reflection of what's going on um, in society. I mean, we've seen, you know, politics become much more polarized in recent years. And so these uh, businesses, was what they are, are just sort of feeding the machine, as Ted Koppel uh, acknowledged there. Uh, there's a huge desire for this sort of information. I mean, it used to be just provided by, you know, the, the Democratic or the Republican parties would be the ones kind of looking for this stuff, uh, to, you know, the, the gaffes. But now you've got an industry that sprung up, multi-million dollar industry. I mean, it reminds me of, you know, of them, the, all these people sitting there watching, listening in. It's like you think of the, the CIA or something, you know, right. listening in on... Um, Big Brother you know, is suddenly right. filtering. But that's what they're doing and just watching all these different broadcasts and watching, you know, uh, l listening to every um, source they can to find some mistake that they can use for, for their benefit in a partisan way. So to me, it's very, I, I mean, I'm really, I find it extremely distasteful, but it, it's out there and, and some of the stuff that they dig up then some of it may turn into be legitimate news. I mean, right, I can't and I think that this that. was. Yeah. I think that that was a legitimate news story, right. but it isn't always. And, and certainly the clients for this information are not necessarily going to report it in a fair and balanced way. So that's what really bothers me about this, uh, is that it just helps to, um, you know, it plays into this, uh, this trend of polarization, um, not just in Washington, D.C., but across the country. And uh, I don't think that's helpful. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. And I think that it's not, and I'm going to say, I think that it's not helpful because, in my opinion, I think that it affects the way um, people view our credibility and it affects, uh, I think, our viewers' trust in us when what we are effectively doing is seeking out errors. And so, Rachel, I want to ask you, you've had experience with trying to tell stories and having people and even sources in fairly innocuous stories say, Saying, do you have to quote me? Can you not use my name? I mean, are you feeling the effects of this, do you think? Oh, absolutely. And I had a professional tell me at one of my internships this summer, well, everyone's just watching too much cops. You know, it's just <laughs> this paranoia that's out there of people feeling like, and that's, it's, it's a backlash because it's true that the media does show mistake after mistake after mistake. But because of that, people are, are getting kind of airtight. Nobody's wanting to really be themselves. And I think, I think, but this might just be my you know, hopefulness, but idealistic, opinion. idealistic yeah. opinion, <laughs> but I think that we really want to see human. We want to see people who are real. And so mistakes, you know, that's an example of somebody being real. That's as real as we get sometimes. But I think that if people kind of owned their mistakes a little bit more, and this is the journalist coming out, just, you know, grit your teeth and bear it get over it. Just own up thing. to it. Say and I screwed up. I think it's on two sides. I, I think public figures need to be more human. They need to be more accessible to people and not just be a public relations figure. But I think the media also probably needs to cut back a bit, maybe, and not be so hard on these people that we voted into office for a specific reason maybe show a little bit more support. I think of the, this gaff trolling as being a really, you mentioned partisanship, and I, I, I see this as being a function of the difference between infotainment and information from us, from the news media. Gaffs, infotainment, inf mm -hmm. interesting, certainly, but information, right. that's our job, not necessarily. Yeah, I think that it's, um, it's really helped to decrease the the level of real discussion that we have in this country. 
I mean, you look at the difference between a local political campaign and a national political campaign where everything is scripted. I mean, even if somebody did want to say, oh, you know what, I just made a mistake, even that would be very scripted. I right, promise right, you. right. Okay, because they'd be worried that somebody would take that and spin it in some way. Um, and, but then you look at the local level, and you can still see kind of that freshness at times, but you know, even that, it's not what it once was. But, um, so I think it's really, really um, hurt the, the level of uh, civil debate that we can have in this country um, because you can't get people being as candid as you'd like them to be. Everything has to be as airtight as they can make it mm -hmm. because they're so worried about making a mistake, how the other side is going to take it and spin it against them. Very true. All right, stand by for just a second with us. Bear with us. We're going to take a quick break. But coming up next on Press Watch, a regular segment that we do in every show, we call it Bravos and Blunders, who are giving a thumbs up for quality journalism, sort of, and then a thumbs down coming up in just a moment. Stick around. Welcome back to Press Watch 2012. It's time now for Press Watch's Bravos and Blunders. A couple examples of the best and worst we've seen in journalism recently. We'll bounce those off of Alex Cameron from News 9 and Rachel Morse, broadcasting student here at OCU. Okay, so we'll start with our Bravo, which I want to preface by saying is a half a Bravo. <laughs> it's kind of a little thumbs up. Um, from the second part of the segment that we saw just a moment ago from Rock Center from NBC magazine style show. The second part of the segment, uh, you know what, I'm not going to describe it any further. Let's look at it first and then let's talk okay. about it. All right. Last week here, Ted Koppel looked into the world of media monitoring, the business of calling people out. Tonight he looks at the media, the volume and vitriol, in particular of the partisan news media, some of whom have gone from watchdogs to combatants, as we said, in just the course of one American generation. The Communist Party leaders of East Germany and Germany. Once there were only three networks, and the evening news anchors told you what was important. Now that's the way it is. Tuesday, January no, that's the way it was. This is how it is. Stop, don't look. Stop the BS here. Stop the crap. Bill O'Reilly, whose contempt for those he calls pinheads put Fox News on the map, is not normally quite this rough on his guests. We used to think of newscasters as finders of fact, of objective fact. Now we have uh, what I see as truth tellers. The problem is they're all sort of retelling their own version of truth. Okay, so here is why I say half a bravo. I think that there is enormous value in turning the camera around on ourselves as journalists and saying, let's examine what we're doing as members of the press, what we're doing to influence the system, how our viewers see us, I think that we are, we are accountable, we should be accountable, we need to be accountable. Um, however, the half a bravo is because in this piece, which obviously was just an excerpt, um, the only thing that they were focusing on was Fox. Bad Fox, yeah. bad Fox for your behavior. Um, Alex, your thoughts? Yeah. and, and <laughs> You know, we all, you know, we know Fox News, they're the easy one to, to point to of because course. they're very conservative. But, you know, there is MSNBC on the on the left. And so certainly uh, the piece could have mentioned that as well. And uh, that was probably a mistake not to do so, because that only reinforces the notion that mainstream media, which this supposedly represents here, is biased um, to the left. And so that's, that's probably, that's a good point. you know, and that's so that's that uh, that's not a good thing. I will say that uh, I did see Ted Koppel on, with Bill O'Reilly on uh, Fox, uh, on his show last week, and he, in that segment, he did talk about MSNBC um, as being, you know, to the left as Fox is to the right. But in this piece, they should have, they should have uh, talked about both sides. I agree. Rachel, I'm just going to ask you to weigh in on the accountability factor because I want you to be thinking about this as you head out the door here. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I, you have to show both sides. It's our job. And so just showing one is kind of like, okay, we get it, but you know, you do it too. So Yay I, for the effort, but let's exactly. take responsibility for ourselves and not exactly. just the guy across the street. Yeah. And I mean, if 
I feel we would respect news stations more if sometimes they would come out and show a little bit more self-examination. Lisa, again, idealist coming out here. Thinking, That's a good thing. Good. That would, I'm all about the idealism. Exactly, exactly. So I, I think this is why the youth is kind of being turned off. It's because they're seeing so much of this yelling at each other and I know well, that's why a lot of my friends say that they don't watch network news anymore or you know any of these stations because they don't even get news they're getting screen matches and so right. I, I think it's a really good examination it just needs to be a little bit more thorough and the screaming is not news you are absolutely right about that all right let's take a look at our blunder for this week I will apologize in advance it's a little bit difficult to watch um, Fox News I feel like I'm picking on Fox News I'm absolutely not not intentionally Gretchen Carlson had an unfortunate live via satellite interview uh, we've condensed it down a little bit let's go ahead and watch that Joining me now is a recent college grad, Max Rice. He voted for President Obama. So. Now he's unemployed and just moved out of his parents' home. Good morning to you, Max. Well, hello, Miss, Miss USA. It's an honor. Uh, Miss America. I wish I could but, see you. But, but close enough. Miss America. Um, Miss Universe in my book. In my book. Oh, okay. Well, well thank you very much. Um, now, tell me your story. Why now are you supporting Mitt uh, what's Romney? What's your question? Why now are you supporting Mitt Romney? Uh, why am I supporting Mitt Romney? It's actually a funny story. I lost a basketball game to a friend of mine. Well, actually, we're going to wrap this up now because I'm not so sure that you're actually oh, we being are? totally serious about that. Uh, I am. Wait, 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 wait. Why not? Yeah, I'm not Gretchen, sure that I'm not you're sure ready? that you're ready for for prime time yet with this interview. I'm not ready for prime time. Wait, I've been. This is. I've been. All right. Oh. oh. <laughs> Yeah. That's painful. Yeah. It really is. And that went on for over two minutes. That oh, 45 God. seconds was tough. But you don't feel sorry for her because it just keeps going on and on and on. And it's up to her to just, you know, all right, we're done. Don't, I wouldn't keep talking back and forth with him. And clearly he's not really invested in it. I, I, <laughs> I wonder, <laughs> were they just so hopeful that eventually this guy was going to come around and say what they wanted, that they just kept him on? I mean, honestly, from the very beginning, <laughs> so. they should have noticed. Uh -uh. I mean, how their producer didn't figure this out before they put him on there. That was the first me. thing I said. Um, seriously, they, yeah, it's a serious blunder. Uh, and she, and she sh I mean, she, their whole crew should be embarrassed. I think so. And it's easy to armchair quarterback. I will say it's easy. That's a hard job. We've done it. Yeah. Live television is tough. But at what point do you not say, you lost a basketball game? Okay, I'm cutting this off right now. Yeah. We're not going to have this conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little painful to watch. Oh, yeah, gosh, I mean, yeah. you got to, they, somebody needed to make the decision very quickly to pull the plug on that. I mean, All yeah. right, closing thoughts from both of you quickly. Um, you know, I just, I, I, I want to go back to, um, of, of, of what we talked about here. I think that, um, journalists have a responsibility, real journalists have a responsibility to, to rise above the partisanship and to do their best to continue to show both sides of an issue. Be respectful, um, you know, as we talked about in the first segment, you know, be mindful of the impact of what pictures and words can have on others and, you know, because sometimes it can be deadly serious and Absolutely. so it's a very very serious job and that's what I advise to you you know because it's you're not you're not getting into it for the glamour you're getting into it because it's an important job to inform people in a fair and balanced way Absolutely. And that's going into this industry. I I want to see more balance. I want to see looking at the people, understanding the people you're interviewing and respecting them. And of course, you know, understanding it's a business and you have to make money and getting more of a balance of that and not just shooting to one extreme or the other. You know, my hope is to kind of go in and have people not be afraid to say something real. Just more real tell, balance. Tell me what you mean. More real I'm, balance. I'm really, I don't want to get the PR, just cut the crap, but not in a Bill O'Reilly way. I'm not going to call you a pinhead. <laughs> thank you. We appreciate but, that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you both so much for joining us today. We really, really do appreciate your time. Excellent. All right, well, that's all the time that we have for Press Watch 2012 today. Press Watch is a production of Oklahoma City University in partnership with the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. We'll do this again next week. We'll see you then.